Welcome to the Transform Your Wealth and Health podcast, where experts in wealth, health, and fitness help transform your life. Here's your host, Andy Arder. Today's guest on the show is HMO and wealth creation expert, Matthew Moody, who has retired at the age of 30 previously and had over 1,000 units that, which were let out. So Matthew, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me on, Great pleasure. to be here, stoked to get going. This is going to be my first ever podcast standing up, so I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> Mine too. Mine too. So we're on the NT1 mic, which you said you'd never used before. Not standing up, no. And neither have I. So we'll see if <laughs> Let's it see works. it goes. Yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely. So, Matthew, I know yeah. you as a, a very successful uh, trainer of HMO people that are interested in yeah. property, but what did you do previous to gain that experience? What did I do before I yes. was in property? Yes. So effectively, about for about ten years before then, I was in the travel and leisure industry. Right. Uh, so really, uh, my background was all around how to maximise yield. Mm -hmm. So hence why being in property and HMOs kind of fits in quite nicely. Yes. Uh, so yeah, a lot of what I was doing was working with car hire companies, and then uh, the the last company I was in was uh, Timeshare, but yeah. not selling it. Hasten to add, uh, but very much <laughs> yeah. looking at how you maximise yield from those units. So it wasn't one of those dirty timeshare no, people that you have to no. wipe your feet as you come out the door. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. So that gives you a little bit of experience in the customer service area. Did you bring that forward into your HMOs? Yeah, I would say so. I think one of the things that when I got started back in HMOs, no one was really doing HMOs. Mm. I and mean, this is one of the things. Mm. So uh, I was very much coming at it from the point of view of aiming at the professional market, yeah. but also taking some of that corporate experience to kind of set up companies in a way that actually would be something that people will want to come back and stay with, but mm. also trying to look at how you treated clients in a way that would effectively uh, a get them to pay the rent on time yeah. and B yeah. get them to actually uh, you know take part in essentially not just the room but being part of a household uh, and obviously sometimes that is yeah. difficult yeah. Uh, but that's always been our aim to kind of create a home from home for people to live in yeah yeah sure so I mean that is the difficult thing about it and one of the things you teach because I've come along to one of your training courses once by the time, is that kind of thing. And it's the peripheral stuff that's actually quite important and quite difficult. So you can say to people, you know, this is the kind of room to have, this is the kind of area you need it in. But those little things about how to create an atmosphere where everyone feels safe and friendly and they want to re-sign up again next year, that's the kind of stuff that you teach, which is slightly different. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's obviously those nitty gritty things, isn't there? You've yeah. got to buy in the right location to begin with. But once you've found a location that works and you start to develop a HMO, then it really comes down to some of those. They're almost the intangibles, but they're the things that actually make the tangible things work. So if you don't have them, then you'll find that tenants won't really stick together. Uh, you'll find that you'll have properties that have got a lot more voids. You'll yeah. find there's a lot more issues in them because effectively you've not really created the environment nor the right kind of rules. Mm -hmm. And whilst we don't like to often talk about rules in terms of generally in society, people don't like rules, right? They always think at the police or whatever, but yeah. it's important in a HMO to have what we call harmonious house guidelines effectively mm -hmm. for, so people do understand that, you know, it's not respectful to say steal someone else's food you know it's not respectful yeah. to go and be playing music at say midnight even though you may wish to yeah. but if you want to do that you might have to go and find your fl a flat or a house or yeah something. sure but be fair Matt when you've come home from the pub late at night and, you, and you're starving for something to eat you know and that's looking at you in the yeah. fridge yeah. it's very tempting you, you have a point, Andy, you have a point, right? But uh, I'm not saying our tenants do that, but yeah, I'm sure some of them do. Sure fair enough, them do. Yeah. fair enough. So your background as a letting agent mm -hmm. managed to get you to the letting agent of your area, uh, 2009, I believe, as the... 2010, agent. yeah. 2010, was it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. So what happened for you to be able to get that award? So that was really a culmination of everything leading up to that effectively. Mm -hmm. So when I first started investing in HMOs, one of the things I realized very quickly is I effectively had taught myself out of one job, which was the job I was doing, working in travel and leisure, into mm -hmm. another job, yeah. i.e. managing properties. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure you'll probably relate to that and some of the, the people you've worked with yeah. will. So I really focused then on how can I get myself out of my job and the only way I could do that was through systems. So I created a lot of systems, probably took me the best part of 18 months to do that, mm -hmm. which was when I then launched 
your hmoexpert.com, the website, yeah. in 2006 to kind of share a little bit of what I've been doing. Uh, and from that, that then really led up to, in 2010, uh, me partnering with two other people uh, and we effectively had a mission and our mission really was very simple it was to develop a national HMO lettings agency and train I think it was a thousand people which is what we did in that year wow. we basically created a national lettings agency we had five offices 30 staff we got up to a thousand units of inventory mm -hmm. our rent roll was just over 100k a month uh, and that's why we basically won the award because yeah. we basically accelerated very very quickly at the beginning of the year I think my letting agency at the time had about 50 units in it and we accelerated to, to a thousand by the end of the year so wow. it was a little bit of a crazy time <laughs> but I mean you say you created systems yeah. what kind of system did you create that enabled you to get that kind of growth? So when you think about systems everyone obviously thinks about a computer yeah. and, and we did have a really good letting agency package that we use and still use to this day in my own letting agencies mm -hmm. But aside from that, it's also it's the people systems and it's also the environmental systems. So what does a house look and feel like when you go into it? You know, what does a cleaner do uh, on week one versus week two? Yeah. What do you do when you sh to show someone around certain viewing? Mm -hmm. These are all things that you can't really have in, a, say, an IT system. You've mm -hmm. got to actually train someone and take them through that on a step-by-step -step yeah, basis. Yeah. So a lot of the things that I've been working on was how to basically take it from my head into a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So. The first time I did it, uh, I created what I call then a portfolio management manual, uh, and that was about 60 to 70 pages. The current lettings manual that we operate to from today is just under 450 pages wow. in terms of written documents, standards, procedures, processes, checklists, etc. 450 yeah, it's, pages. It's a sizable so book. It is, isn't it? But, you know, you've got to learn from the best. And, you know, yeah. I, I did a, a lot of uh, kind of studying that time in terms of what was going on and how to kind of extract myself from basically running around like an idiot. <laughs> uh, and I took a lot of learnings from Michael E. Gerber from the EMIF Revisited, yeah, which yeah. I, I know you're aware of. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he talks about this whole kind of McDonald's thing about the fact that basically they can yeah. take people from the streets, get them on the till in two hours and they can at least serve because they go through a certain very stringent training process yeah, sure. uh, and it's exactly the same with property I think if, mm. you, if you get people trained in the right way you give them the right tools and you back them up with a system then you can basically conquer whatever you want to conquer. Sure. Well I basically came across you probably two three years ago where you was offering some training in central London as the HMO expert, a three day course for £97. I've yeah. got to tell you now, yeah. it's the best course I've been on for property. I've been on a few. All right, times. okay. Um, I'll be nice. 97 quid. Excellent. Say, you just you say know. that again to the camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the best course I've been on for 97 quid. You know, come on. So, um, no, I mean, yeah. But obviously that's excellent value and there is yeah. some upselling etc yeah. etc yeah. and you, as you'd expect for, for, for £97 in a, in a top London hotel but did you in, initially envisage that you were going to do your training like that or was you actually just going to put it online or how did you initially think that you did That's that? a really good question actually and I think uh, I'm a person that likes to meet other people uh, and just because you can bounce ideas off them and and sometimes I find it quite difficult on webinars so you'll notice I don't really do a lot of webinars we are going to be doing some online training which we're just creating right now because yeah. there's a huge demand for it and we've surveyed our list recently of yeah. you know clients and they've said you know we really would like some online training and they get that and we're going to do that but mm -hmm. For me, live events is is the place to be if you really want to, I think, learn quickly, almost acclimatise yourself to a way of thinking and also network with other people yeah. because you can't get that really from from online. Mm. So, mm. yeah, the event we put on, I think it was, that was the 2016 Ultimate HMO Convention you came to. You've got a good memory. I have. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, it, it, was, it was a great event because we kind of took everyone through that journey of, starting from zero and then at the end of the three days you really had the tools if you wanted to yeah. go out and actually do something with I, that. I would say had, you're right, you yeah. Know. yeah. And some of the guys I, I met on the course there I still actually talk to, so I've uh, made some good friends there. So. Awesome, great. Yeah, good, thank you. Good to hear. Um, now you retired at 30, didn't you? Yeah. How come? So, it's kind of like a funny story I guess, but I uh, was working for this company at the time, RCI, and it was making really good money, but I was basically, I was almost, the, our department was basically the police. 
So I was in charge of revenue management, which basically meant that every decision that had anything to do with revenue had to come through us, mm -hmm. as opposed to finance. So yeah. that meant that you often sent to troubleshoot issues. So I might be sent to Cancun, which sounds great, yeah. but it's not when you're there for 36 hours. Yeah. It's not great. So you go in, out, you know, and off you go again. So I kind of made this decision that this wasn't for me and I wanted to really get out of that. So I started developing uh, my, myself in terms of education, from both a mindset perspective and also what is possible, and that's how I got into HMOs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I managed to basically engineer a way out of the company that I was at, and that meant that I had to replace the income very, very quickly. Right. Uh, and, and that's why I decided to, to, to basically go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took me about 18 months, but effectively I replaced my entire income, which meant yeah. that in essence, as Rich Dad Purdo calls it, I was financially free. Well, hey. <laughs> so then I could effectively, you know, that was it, I was kind of done. Brilliant. So I come from one of Tottenham's worst estates and it was a council house area, plenty of people that didn't have a lot of money. So I try and be aspirational and try and get those people that are out there that could do with a little bit more money to think in a different way. And people like yourself I interview and also the health professionals, people that are fitness experts, to try and get everybody a little bit healthier, me included, and to try and push things forward for people. So what ways would you say people who are interested in property might be able to push themselves forward? So let me answer that by answering another question first. Go I think it. to begin with, yeah. people have to be clear on what it is that they want. And I think one of the issues in today's society generally is no one generally has a clue what they want. Right. They kind of think, oh, it'd be great, you know, if I won Britain's Got Talent, let's say, or if I was on Love Island, this, yeah. that, and the other. Yeah. But they don't really, you know, a lot of people want to be, say, Instagram famous, but yeah. they don't really understand what that is or what is it as a goal. So yeah. I think before they kind of start looking into property, they should really think about what it is they want, in, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things I talk about a lot is that, you know, most people in this uh, country that we live in, the UK, mm -hmm. have a, on average, a pension of 50,000. That's yeah. the average pension. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna give most people two and a half K a year. Now you can't live on that. No. State pension's 114 pound a week. Yeah. Yeah. Difficult to live on that too. Yeah. So yeah. people have got to have options, and the only other op the, the the only options available really is put the money into a pension, and that's going to cost you anything from eight hundred to fifteen hundred pounds per month to mm -hmm. get to a pension that will give you the average UK salary of twenty six k, which again is not fantastic, but it's better than two and a half k a year. Yeah. Or develop strategies to basically build some assets. Yeah. And for me, if you look at the assets that are out there right now, there's property, there's stocks and shares, yeah. there's currency in some description, including crypto, uh, there's probably building some type of business online or offline, and that's pretty much it. Mm. So I think for me, in terms of property, it's all about the leverage. Mm. And hence why I think it's so important that everyone should have at least a couple of properties because mm. you cannot get any other asset from a bank without having to put in 100% of your money. Yeah, there's leverage there, isn't there? Yeah. Precisely, but yeah. property, you can put 25% down, 75% yeah. they'll loan to you. Yeah. So what I would say to someone that's really keen on getting started in property, and we have a lot of people on some of the groups that we manage kind of ask these questions, you know, what should I do first, is go and devour as much information as you can, both yeah. online and offline. So yeah. buy five or six or seven books about different strategies and different things that might work. Uh, go and listen to some podcasts, yeah. you know, go and maybe uh, watch some videos online, there's loads of videos on YouTube, and go to a few events, mm. you know, and there are free events, Personally, I would say avoid them because they're normally pitch fests, but you can go to events, say 20, 30 quid, similar to one of the events we're holding tomorrow, it's 15 pounds, mm -hmm. and you're gonna learn reasonable content at a reasonable level that'll give you enough flavor to think, is this something I'd like to do? Yeah, yeah. Because obviously not everybody wants to do, say, HMOs, which is what I do. Yeah. Some people wanna do you know, refurbishment, or some people wanna do, say, flat development, or whatever it may be, but mm -hmm. you've gotta do something that you're at least, I think, interested in. Yeah. Uh, and I think the other thing as well is kind of going on a bit beyond your question is uh, once you've chosen a strategy, yeah. stay the course. Yeah. Because it's so easy to switch and change and think, oh, I'm, I'm building up a portfolio and let's say I'm doing flat refurbishments, I'm really, really good at it. And you see this little shiny pain in the distance, it's mm. like, oh, it'd be really good if I could go and do this, like whatever it is. And people then take their eye off the ball yeah. and then before you know it, you spend a load of time and energy on this thing 
that hasn't delivered you anything, yeah. may have messed up, and these things here are kind of like festering away in the background yeah. and not creating any money for you. Yeah. So, don't know if that really answers yeah. your question, but that's kind no, of my no, take on no, it. Pretty yeah. much so. Yeah. Two more difficult questions then, Matthew. Go for okay. it. The first yeah. one, um, let's go for this one first, actually. Now, as you know, I do health and wealth. So on the health side, what do you do to keep fit? So on the health side, <laughs> uh, effectively, a couple of things. So I... Uh, I would say I've never been someone from my childhood that was kind of encouraged to say do a lot of sport activity. Yeah. When I was growing up, I was very much into rugby league, so mm -hmm. I used to play that all the time, and then basically lost my eyesight effectively. You know, I weren't wearing contacts a day, so yeah. I couldn't see the ball. Mm -hmm. And if you're a rugby league player, not seeing the ball is kind of a little bit tough. Not, not good. So you know, I think for me it was kind of one of the things that schools are really bad at is showing people what to do to keep themselves healthy and I think half the battle is the food you eat mm -hmm. and then the other battle is what exercise do you do that you actually enjoy yeah so I'd say what I've learned and, and I'm doing actively now and I've, I've been doing this for probably about two two and a half three years now is uh, being careful about what I eat and I generally follow uh, the kind of Tim Ferriss way of eating mm -hmm. which is essentially no white carbs during the week and have a cheat day once a week mm -hmm. and everything else is just very much around you know beans and pulses and vegetables right. and protein okay. uh, and then going to the gym uh, and I think the thing about going to the gym which I also figured out for myself probably about 18 months two years ago is that mm -hmm. you've got to be accountable yeah and the thing about going to a gym membership and I'm sure there's tons of people who've got a gym membership mm -hmm. you're paying 30 40 quid a month <laughs> and you don't go, go but yeah. you've got a gym membership so that's great right <laughs> yes. uh, but I found that by hiring a personal trainer that really focused me to be yeah. accountable and actually turn up because I knew if I didn't turn up A I'd have wasted that cash and I hate wasting cash yeah. but B that person would also feel let down because he's blocked out that diary for me you could yeah. have put someone else in there yes. and so on and so forth so generally on average I, I do two sessions a week with my PT three sessions on my own mm -hmm. and then normally have the weekends off. I try and get out for a walk if I can, not always possible, okay. but sometimes, yeah. So you're, you're doing quite a bit then, really, aren't I'm you? I'm trying my best. Okay. I'd say my issue right now is probably losing the fat. I've put on lots of muscle, which is great, which mm -hmm. is burning off the fat. I just want to lose more fat, yeah. and I know that will come. Okay. Uh, but I've never been like, you know, you see these people around the streets, you know, like, like your son, they're like live, and they're just like <laughs> so skinny, it's like never been We're, like a skinny kid, but I understand you can get there, it's a lot of work to do yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, and also everyone wants everything at once, don't they? Yes. It's like, you know, we'd all like to take a pill and wake up in the morning and look like The Rock or whoever, wouldn't we? It would be amazing, yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely, but it, it just takes a little bit of time and effort. Okay. Uh, I think the other thing as well that keeps me going is, every two years I generally do some kind of challenge. Uh, I'm not doing one this year because effectively I, I did one last year mm -hmm. but I'm aiming to do one ne next year so the one I did last year was a 312 mile bike challenge with my brother wow. basically to raise money for uh, the armed forces charity mm -hmm. so we ended up raising 10 grand but most importantly we had this thing to focus on which was this crazy bike ride coast to coast there and back uh, in six days which doesn't sound that long, so it's only 312 miles, yeah. but let me tell you, when you're carrying all of your stuff yes. and you're going up and down hills, yeah. it, it's, it's tiring. So basically, we're out doing about 60 miles a day, started at around eight, half eight, finished about five every day. Uh, it, it was tough, mm. but it was a great challenge to do. Okay. So next year, I'm gonna be putting one together. I don't know what it's gonna be yet, but it most likely will be with my brother. Uh, to keep me motivated and accountable. Good, good. Okay, good yeah. to hear it. So, the second question, there's some people out there saying that it's getting harder to do HMOs at the moment. So yeah. What do you feel about that? It's an interesting question, and uh, another question I get asked, which is very similar to that, is, is the market oversaturated? Mm -hmm. And I hear that all the time. And I yeah. think there's two answers to that. One, it is if you believe it is, and two, is it really? So you really have to f approach it from the perspective of, another question I get asked all the time is, oh, what's the best place to invest? And that's kind of like saying, well, you know, <laughs> is the, you know, the 210 at Cheltenham gonna come in first or last tomorrow, whatever that horse is, I yeah. have no idea. You know, everywhere in the UK, there is demand for accommodation. Mm. In terms of if there's demand for your particular type of HMO, because 
remember there are five different types of HMO that you could run from students, DSS, right through to professionals, yeah. there may not be demand. So I think uh, investors need to carefully research their area. They need to run adverts to test demand for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to be really on top of looking at the changes that are going to happen in the marketplace as well. Because mm -hmm. let's say you're investing in a town and it's got a major employer. And that employer maybe has a thousand people working there. But that employer potentially is at risk of exiting for whatever reason. Yeah. Brexit. Middle East, Far East, yeah. pressures, whatever it may be, then you have to think seriously about, is it actually worth me doing that or should I maybe concentrate on another area? Yeah. So I would say it's becoming more difficult in terms of the HMO market. There are more people doing it. There are more people doing it badly. Mm -hmm. The council are still trying to get rid of rogue landlords and I cannot foresee in time when they'll ever get rid of them because they just literally flout the law. Right. Uh, there are definitely more HMOs out there. However, You've got to think of it from the point of view of quality. And uh, because we run a portfolio building service for investors who want to build HMOs from a hands-free perspective, mm -hmm. we buy a lot of properties and we see the state of some of these HMOs. Yeah. And most people would not want to live in it. No. And I think one of the issues that I see, which I'm kind of... It, it, it grieves me and it also annoys me at the same time and it also makes me passionate to change things, is people being taken advantage of that are vulnerable because they don't know any better. Yeah. And you know, certainly people coming into the country who don't know that you shouldn't be sharing free to a room and don't know that you should actually have running water and don't know that you can uh, turn the heating off if you feel like it is as a landlord, you have to give heat to tenants. That kind of thing annoys me. Mm. Uh, and I think you know, the more that the government does to get rid of rural landlords, the better. Yeah. The problem is I can't foresee it ever really ending because there's so many of them. Mm. Uh, but I would say, to answer your question fully, I don't think the market is dead. I think there's still some way to go. We've yeah. still got 300,000 homes or half a million if you consider some of the other surveys out there of yeah. actual demand. And what we're seeing nowadays is there's a big opportunity for couples. Now, one of the issues with couples is the fact that, generally speaking, HMOs, as you know, are very much dictated on the size of the room and the amenities. So we're in your lovely attic room right now, <laughs> and it's a great size room, yeah. but from a council perspective, they'd only count the bits which haven't got the eaves in yeah. as the room oh, size, right. mm -hmm. and that may not actually be big enough for a room, mm -hmm. even though this is plenty big enough to get a double bed in and so on yeah. and so forth. So, you know, couples is a big, big opportunity. The problem is the government haven't quite cotton on to this yet and are still thinking in the 1900s unfortunately so a lot of the demand from that sector cannot be met mm -hmm. unless it's through rogue landlords yes. that's one of the major issues yeah. so we've got dozens of properties that we could rent out to couples but we cannot because all of our properties are generally licensed yeah. and the license for maybe one person in a room yeah not, not what two. area are you in Matt by the way so uh, our major main agency is in covers Northamptonshire mm -hmm. Derby Bedford Cambridge, Huntingdon, and then we have a secondary branch we've just opened up, which is Bury in Manchester. Right. And then our aim is to expand that uh, over the next uh, you know, three or four years into mm. a lot more locations. Yes. Well, I always look at things in terms of sales. So, in other words, if you're not suffering, then your market's not suffering. So, in other words, if you take somebody else's lunch, they've got a problem, you haven't. So, although the overall market may be not as buoyant as it once was, you haven't got a problem if you haven't got a problem. So you yeah. know, ultimately do it well, and go to the rules, make sure that you're doing it properly, and you should be okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So we're just getting towards the end of the show now, Matt. Okay. So you mentioned earlier that you had a course and you're just about to do one, but what have you got for the future? Okay, so one of the things uh, that I'm really passionate about is giving quality education. Mm -hmm. So we basically have developed a suite of programs around our HMO expertise or my HMO expertise yeah. that is accredited by a major bank. Right. So that effectively means that You're people to say what bank? Yeah, it's Shawbrook Bank. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So effectively, people that come on board and work through our programs, and it's uh, they can do it either on a modular basis or they can do it in a very intense kind of three-day basis. Mm -hmm. Effectively, get accredited. 
and that gives them access to a credit line. Right. Obviously subject to status and all those good things, mm -hmm. but you know, providing that you've not run off with someone and become <laughs> bankrupt and got jail sentences and all that, normally you're okay. The normal stuff. Yeah, yeah the normal stuff. Uh, but what that means is that it's allowed us to recreate all of the training that you came on like a few years ago mm -hmm. into a way that is a lot more focused on becoming uh, an educational institute, which is effectively what we're leaning towards becoming at some point in the yeah. future, where we can accredit our own programs ourselves. So at the moment it's through Shaw Rook, we're also working with CPD to get the program as accredited by them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but it just means that the type of training that we're doing delivers tangible benefits. So it's not just the fact that you're learning, you're actually getting qualified at the same time. And we are really focusing very hard on getting people to uh, take on board the training and then implement and also test them later. So you do do a test on all of our programs to make sure you've taken in the information. Right. And it's not a difficult test, but mm -hmm. it's designed to get you thinking about, okay, multiple choice, A, B, C. And if you deliberately, or not deliberately, if you're not taking in the information and you're ticking the wrong boxes, then clearly you've got to go back and relearn it. Mm. So I think that's, that's really helped us. But uh, yeah, in terms of things coming up, you know, the main thing for us is our big HMO summit. We yeah. generally run that once a year. That's on the 25th. 20th and 21st of October in London. Okay. It's the HMO and Rent to Rent Summit. So we'll be covering everything to do with HMOs and Rent to Rent. Uh, it's a two day summit this time, so uh, Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. And we've got a variety of different speakers that are coming in to talk about very specific topics. Uh, so how to source the right type of deal, mm -hmm. how to perhaps uh, find properties when you haven't got very much money to then turn them into, say, rentable properties without a lot of money. Yeah how you can utilize serviced accommodation aspect of rent to rent as well, you know, in mm. terms of making yeah, you know, really good money. Yeah. Uh, how to uh, market yourself so you can fill your tenant rooms up really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, other things in terms of we're looking at the elements of taxation and what to do if you've got a portfolio right now and you need to kind of extract yourself and what yeah. the options are. So we're gonna have uh, one of the big tax firms speaking about that. Uh, and a variety of different topics, but the whole aim of the, the kind of summit is to give great information that people can take and it's aimed at people that are just getting started but also people that are already in the market because we are going to be running some advanced modules kind of breakout sessions so to speak mm -hmm. where people can get in a room and they can talk about something uh, I think one of the topics we're going to be talking about is uh, around online portals and yeah. how you can get the best visibility on the portals because right now they've changed a lot of the algorithms and because we advertise on these all day long we've kind of seen what they've been doing so we've been trying some things so we're yeah. going to be reporting on our own test results to show what works and what doesn't you know video is really big right now but mm -hmm. does it work on the portals right. we have to come and find out and we'll tell you okay. but yeah so we're going to be going through a whole bunch of stuff and effectively uh it's, it's going to be great and you know for, for, for your subscribers we're doing mm -hmm. a special Early right. bird deal. Yeah, I know you mentioned yeah. it previously. Tell us all yeah. about it. Yeah, so the tickets for the uh, two day event, uh, we, we have general and we have VIP tickets. Uh, and general tickets are starting at 197 plus VAT. Mm -hmm. We'll be uh, offering an early bird discounted price at £97 plus VAT. Right. And I think that's if they book before, I think it is, the round about the 10th yeah. of September. Yeah. There's a little bit of time to think about it, but don't think too long, yeah. because once the 10th goes, uh, it'll be gone. Oh, so you. we'll give you a special discount code so you can use that. Lovely. And it will expire on the 10th of September. Okay, so if you're listening to this on the 9th, <laughs> don't delay, <laughs> jump on board and grab a ticket. Quickly. And then obviously for people that want a little bit more of a VIP or elite experience, there is those options to, to get those tickets. Yeah, and that sure. basically includes more access to the speakers and some other things that we're doing plus uh, on the Saturday evening we are doing an industry fest that's never been done before and I mm -hmm. can't really tell you much more about it on oh, tape but you got to be there a little to bit. see it oh can we have a little a little something Matthew? all I can say is yeah. it involves sports yes it involves awards and it involves something else which I can't mention all just right. yet fair enough for me. Yeah. we got a little bit out of you anyway <laughs> Okay. Well, listen, thanks for giving us the uh, the early bird discount there, and thank you for coming along today. So, Pleasure. is there anything else that we need to talk about, Matt, before we say goodbye? I'll just say this, this one thing. So, I know a lot of people listen to a lot of podcasts, and often you listen, and then it's just, so what, and you move on. I mm. think, you know, we're at a time where people need to take control of their future wealth, and they need to take control of it themselves. Yep. We can't rely on government, we can't rely on your employer, whoever that may be. You've got to take control of your financial future. And yeah. I'd say, even if you just bought one property every two years, just one property every two years, I'm not even asking that much, 
then you would really, by the time you come to retirement age, you would not have to worry about very much mm. because of the fact that the price of the property would have gone up in value, you'd be getting some rental income, and you've got some options. Do you sell it? Do you refinance it? What do you want to do? Mm -hmm. But just, just buy one okay. and wait. Great advice. Matt, what's the best way for people to get hold of you? Best way is always for our website, yourhmoexpert.com. Uh, we are just about to do a huge relaunch of the entire site, but it is still up there right now. You can get free information on there, downloads, uh, audios, videos, blog articles, everything's up there. Just, just go to that website. Okay, All right. thanks very much, Matt. All right, no worries. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Cheers. If you like this kind of information that we're giving you, please tell your friends, share, comment on the show, and give us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from and help us to grow the show. Thanks very much.